On that day of infamy, December 7th, 1941, without warning, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and battlefronts suddenly blazed against America around the world. History will record how Pan American, with its vital air routes across the seas, was, with our armed forces, the first to feel the Japs blow. Under the stars and stripes, and the emblem of Pan American World Airways, the United States had at its command in Pan American the only worldwide air transport system in existence. This globe-circling network of airlines had been pioneered through 15 years of historic progress. Airlines to serve America's peacetime trade. When war struck, these routes became the lifelines between our arsenal of democracy and battle stations and allies across the seven seas. Overnight, this work of air routes, these men and women in the flying clipper ships at their bases from San Juan to Singapore, from the Aleutians to Australia, were converted into lifelines of America's battle for freedom. When it can be told in full, this will be one of the truly great stories of the war. The story of the struggle to keep open those routes around the three Americas, across the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the South Seas, over the South Atlantic into the jungles and deserts of Africa to Egypt and India, beyond the Arctic Circle and Alaska. It's the story of men working until they dropped in their tracks to keep the ships in the air, to speed our fighting men and their leaders, our statesmen, and supplies to five continents. When hostilities began, 25,000 men and women of Pan American's peacetime family plunged at once into war. The Clippers and all of their aides were in the struggle and in it all the way. Now that victory has been won, military security permits us to tell some of that story here. A story that had its beginning 15 years earlier. It was in 1927 that the United States established its first overseas air service when Pan American Airways struggled across a 90 mile route between Key West and Havana the first tri-motored airplane built in America, the Fokker F-7, made the first flight. The following year, the first American Marine air transport plane was put into service by Pan American. Produced by Sikorsky, this plane could come down on either land or water. Eight sacks of mail and six small cases of express seemed a big cargo in those days. Its passengers were merry in anticipation of a pioneering air voyage. But it was these routes which became the laboratory in which men and ships were trained and fitted to tackle the great oceans. Ahead, airmen blazed the trail, challenged every mile of the way by Europe's subsidized airlines. Soon from Miami, larger clippers were reaching Havana and beyond. They flew over the bay where Columbus landed in 1492. Past the ancient citadel in Haiti. To San Juan, Puerto Rico. To the rubber-rich jungle ports of Brazil. Down to magnificent Rio de Janeiro. Past Iguazu Falls. And on to Buenos Aires, Argentina's capital. A partnership company, Pan American Grace Airways, completed the circle over the mighty Andes and the lake country of Chile. Up the west coast by way of Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, and on to Panama. From there, Pan American sped to California and Texas via Central America and Old Mexico. But while Pan American was forging the first links between the Americas, powerful European airlines were pushing toward the Far East. To meet them, America had to fly 9,000 miles across the Pacific. Ahead into the Pacific went an army of young Americans to build bases thousands of miles apart over a string of tiny deserted atolls. A million items, over 6,000 tons from the holes of the supply ship. Diesel electric plants, food, fuel, lumber, pipe, complete equipment for an American colony poured forth onto barges, then through the heavy surf. First, Midway Island. Then, 1,200 miles farther, that uninhabited, desolate lump of coral, Wake Island. Under the blazing sun, an entire community arose, complete with electricity, sewers, coal storage, and modern hotels for future air travelers. Then on to build similar bases at Guam and Manila, and complete the line to Hong Kong. Bases built and surveys completed, the great China Clipper poised for takeoff. A pioneer transport of a bygone age bids her Godspeed. 
Heroes of pioneering America's new high road of the skies were Captain Ed Music and his valiant clipper crew. 3 p.m. November 22, 1935, the China Clipper rose from San Francisco. First, Trans-Pacific through schedule to the Orient, the first airline in the world to span an ocean. From Pan American's own radio stations, which later did war service, her crew learned the weather and kept their course through the clouded night. As the sun dawned upon a new day, it also dawned upon a new era in aviation. The China Clipper, but 17 hours from San Francisco, passes Makapu Light in Hawaii, the first scheduled flight to these lands beyond the sunset. Flying precision that thrilled a watching world. On to Midway, Wake, Guam, Manila, and into her base at Hong Kong. In all the history of the Pacific, there can be no more thrilling chapter. The China Clippers sail again. In 1939 marked another turning point in world air transport. It brought the super clipper ships, 42-ton giants, largest in the world, with wingspan of half a city block. War had exploded over the entire world. Every Pan American route was now a war route. The clipper ships and the men who flew them were instantly at our country's service. Each could lift 75 passengers with tons of mail and express. In just a few days, these cargoes were delivered on the other side of the world. Overnight, these baby chicks and their Pullmans were in their new home in Hawaii, 2,400 miles away. The new aerial trade routes across the Pacific brought Asia to our very doorstep. From the Los Angeles Gateway in Hawaii, the Clippers winged out across the South Pacific, down under by way of Suva and Noumea to New Zealand, bringing us within a few flying hours of the continent of Australia. On July 12, 1940, the Pacific Clipper arrived at New Zealand. It was 17 days by the fastest ocean liners. The Clippers now took less than 100 hours from San Francisco and Los Angeles. Over the northern Great Circle route, Pan American blazed the first U.S. air trail toward the Orient, from Seattle to Alaska, halfway to Asia. The Lockheed Lodestar conquered 60 below temperatures, conquered the icings and fogs, and the uncharted hazards of great Arctic mountains. A few years later, this Alaska pioneering helped to stop the Japs at Kiska and Attu. Finally, after 10 years of pioneering, Pan American conquered the last overseas air transport frontier, the North Atlantic. On the Northwood Circle, Pan American surveys flew to Newfoundland, Ireland, and the British Isles. The southern route was by Bermuda and the Azores to Portugal and France. On May 22, 1939, the Yankee Clipper glided onto the Mediterranean at Marseille, inaugurating the first air mail and passenger service across the Atlantic. Captain Harold Gray and his crew received a great ovation for these history-making flights that conquered the stormy Atlantic. Over the northern route, London and the British Isles were brought within 24 hours of New York City. Amazing was the growth of Pan American's flying clipper ships over the 15 pioneering years. First, the Fokker F-7. Then the Sikorsky's S-38. The Consolidated Commodore. The Sikorsky S-43. The Douglas DC-3. The Sikorsky S-42. The Boeing 307. The Martin 130. The Douglas DC-4. The Boeing 314. And tomorrow, Clipper X will carry 204 passengers to London between lunch and dinner. Before the war, Pan American Clippers covered 98,000 miles of routes. Miami, Florida was typical of Pan American's gateways to the Southern Americas. Electric bulletins announced departures of Clippers to the 20 republics to the south. Clipper voyages became so popular that 100,000 air travelers pass through this port every year. Daily, tons of mail and express are flown to the Central Americas, to the great republics of South America, and across the South Atlantic to Africa.
Just before the war, Pan American brought out the first American four-engine land transport, the Boeing 307, a pioneer Stratoclipper and forerunner of the great land planes of today. Had it not been for the war, ships of this type would have replaced clipper flying boats over ocean as well as over land. Here, passengers are boarding one of the first 307s, diplomats southward bound, coffee merchants for Brazil, petroleum men for Venezuela, sugar planters for Puerto Rico, and vacationers. These huge silver stratoclippers with their four powerful 1,250 horsepower engines can cruise above the weather through the substratosphere at 250 miles an hour. Their cabins are air conditioned so that the pressure inside can be kept at almost ground level, although flying at 20,000 feet in the sky. Another great achievement in transocean flying. The standards of Pan American were world renowned. The flight across the Pacific was typical of the service which won America world leadership in the air. The overnight crossing of the Pacific to Hawaii was a revelation in comfort and speed. At Honolulu, each passenger was presented with fragrant garlands of ginger, carnations, and jasmine, which symbolized the hospitality of these romantic islands. The welcoming hula, interpreted by Hawaii's prettiest daughters, greeted the Clipper Voyager. Midway Island, travelers found a modern community built by Pan American pioneers on a coral atoll. It was a little bit of the United States halfway to Asia. Here one could find all the comforts and all the luxuries in this ultra-modern hotel, as well as fun and relaxation such as enjoyed at any mainland resort. The Clipper travelers next put in at Wake Island, 5,000 miles from America's mainland. Since its colonization by Pan American, Wake Island became a famous port, and when the scant soil failed to support a garden, they improved the food supply of this distant American outpost by farming with chemicals. Specially schooled chefs prepared food brought thousands of miles from America and Asia for travelers dining in the hotel or aloft on the clippers. From Wake, the clippers soared over the strategic lifeline to Guam, a palm-covered tropical isle in the path of the trade winds. to Manila, where the United States and the Philippine Commonwealth had joined in developing a bustling capital. Then to Singapore, or to Hong Kong, on the other side of the world from our own. In five days, the traveler had covered 10,000 miles and was transplanted by these new aerial highways to the strange and colorful lands of the Orient. On an evening late in 1941, as the Anzac Clipper winged along on one of thousands of routine flights, the passengers ate a meal prepared at one of the island hotels. The cuisine aboard the Flying Clippers became world famous to international air travelers. Here, flying along at 200 miles an hour, 8,000 feet in the sky, tables were gay, and the tempting foods would tickle the palate of any gourmet. Passengers smacked their lips over a flavorful blend of coffee. Oh, that's sunny. That's no way to eat cake. The steward made ready the Pullman-like berths, as he had done a thousand times before. 
Every convenience was to be found aboard, from electric razors for the men to deluxe appointments for the ladies as they prepared for a restful night. Two hours out of Honolulu, the sun pushed over the horizon as on any other day. The Anzac Clipper roared on. Everything was clock-like. The captain was at the controls. The engineer was making a log entry. The navigator was checking the course. Out of the stillness came the ship's call letters. Some routine message, doubtless. The date was December 7th, 1941. The secret message read simply Plan A, but its meaning was electrifying. This one word and one letter message meant that war had come to the Pacific. The captain summoned the chief steward to the flight deck. Black out the windows, wake everybody up, and get them together in the lounge. Pan American was ready. Flight and ground crews all knew their war jobs. First, they must get this clipper and its passengers out of the way of the enemy. Pick up anything you can, but don't send anything. The Japs are still out there. Give me another thousand horsepower. We've got to get away from here, fast. The captain and navigator plotted a new course. It was away from the known clipper routes. It accorded with plan A. Quickly, the clipper was blacked out. Running lights were turned off. The navigator by now had determined his course and gave data to the first officer. He adjusted the automatic pilot, turned the clipper toward a secret destination. It had all happened in minutes. The passengers gathered sleepy and bewildered. Sorry we had to get you up but I have some very serious news. The Japs have just bombed Pearl Harbor. We are at war, but every man in this crew knows his war job, knows what to do, so don't be alarmed. We will take every measure for your protection. The Clipper has changed its course, and we are now heading for a safe port. From our nation's capital, while the explosions of Jap bombs were still echoing, Pan American Airways received its first orders from the Army. The company already had been fighting a commercial battle with the Axis for two years. Now came all-out war. The Navy also had urgent work for Pan American to do. Its globe-covering routes and 25,000 men and women were now a vital part of our country's war machine. Over the wires went an order to all Pan American's divisions. It was the now famous All Facilities Order, changing the Clippers of Peace to Clippers at War. The entire 90,000-mile system of Pan American Airways enlisted. Out over the ether, through Pan American's worldwide system of 239 radio stations, from New York to Singapore, I relayed the orders of the Army and Navy to the clippers on every ocean. 2,500 miles west of Pearl Harbor, the Philippine clipper had just left Wake for Guam when it received its war orders. In 20 minutes, Captain Hamilton landed back at Pan American's strategic base on Tiny Wake. Major Devereaux of Wake's Marines asked him to take the clipper in search of Jap planes or carriers. It was too late. Before Captain Hamilton could get back to his clipper, the terrible pounding of Wake was on. The Jap planes roared down. They shattered everything on the island. In minutes, the Pan American Hotel and other buildings were in flames. Japs riddled the Philippine clipper with 97 bullet holes, but couldn't stop her. Captain Hamilton stripped her of all excess gear and jammed 70 civilians into her cabin till the sides almost bulged. After three tries, the clipper staggered off the water. One Pan American man was left behind to help the Marines with their wounded. 
Dodging through the clouds, the Clippers sped on through enemy threatened skies. En route, Captain Hamilton warned Wake of the approach of a Jap cruiser and two destroyers. Before speeding on to stricken Pearl Harbor, she landed at Midway, where Jap shells had already fallen and refueled in a lake of fire. Philippine Clipper, safely at San Francisco, brought the first eyewitness reports for our military intelligence experts of the disaster at Pearl Harbor and the Wake and Midway bombings. Meanwhile in Hong Kong, the Japs massed a surprise air attack. Their bombs got the Hong Kong Clipper, the only Clipper to be lost across the 20,000 miles of Pacific air routes. The Japs showered bombs over the Clipper's berth in the harbor of Hong Kong. While docks, ships, and tinderbox homes were still in flames, and Jap Zero still nearby, Pan American's partnership company, China National Aviation Corporation, flew to safety 275 officials and civilians, including Madam Sun Yat-sen and many of the country's war leaders. They could make their flights only at night under enemy fire, and through bad weather, the Japs couldn't fly in. The Pacific Clipper was cut off near New Zealand. These Clippers, 12 of them, were the only airplanes in the world capable of carrying a real load across an ocean. She had to be saved for America's war service. Never before had a plane completed a long southern circuit of the globe. Never were the obstacles greater, but Captain Robert Ford and his crew did it. They took their huge flying boat across deserts and dangerous mountains where she could not make an emergency landing on a secret course by Australia, India, Arabia, Africa, and Brazil to New York. As the first clouds of smoke cleared, Pan American's peace lines had already become the lifelines over which the United States reached the battlefronts. Back at their home bases, the Silver Clippers quickly took on dull camouflage to blend with the night in the clouds. Pan American and the United States Navy worked out special camouflage specifications. Soldiers joined the police to guard the Clippers. Serving humanity at the start of the war, Clippers flew refugees away from the Nazi terror. They set out on secret flights, often at night. They brought their grateful passengers to this country only one day from the bomb-swept old world. Maintenance jobs that took a day must be boiled down to an hour or two to speed the Clippers off on faster and faster wartime schedules. Wartime Clipper engines sped presidents, prime ministers, and generals overseas. They had to get through. The Secretary of War said the services of Pan American men and women were of vital importance to the war effort. These people were behind the men who flew the planes and took the 1,001 war supply items to the battlefronts. At wartime training schools, Pan American veterans passed their knowledge to specially picked young men of the military services.
Pan American men designed unique dummy control panels for training Navy personnel. They duplicated the many dials, valves, levers of a real airplane. An instructor's panel hooked up electrically with a student's practice panel. This device duplicated conditions of actual flight and recorded the student's reactions. Thus, training, which formerly required months, now took only weeks. And the actual planes were out flying instead of tied up at docks for students to learn from their real controls. Pan American engineers designed a huge fuel system demonstrator. Through transparent plastic, the students saw the flow of fuel to carburetors, pumps, and meters of Navy transport planes. At Miami, Pan American trained thousands of aviation cadets for the U.S. Army and our allies. These flight officers learned how to take big transport planes to distant corners of the earth with men and material, and how to bomb Berlin, Tokyo, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. They boarded flying classrooms to learn while doing. Pan American veterans from the seven seas taught them navigation. Five thousand cadets have already graduated from Pan American's navigation school. Some of these men were navigators on Major General Jimmy Doolittle's smashing raid on Tokyo. At still another Pan American school, Army and Navy flight crews learned radio communication, the ears and voice of the big bombers and transports. On graduation day, fledglings became fully equipped flyers. Thousands of these Pan American trained men received U.S. Army commissions. They've flown on every battlefront. They've bombed the enemy from Munich to Nagasaki. They've flown the ammunition that turned the tide. They've rushed wounded to hospitals where their lives were saved. Another Pan American contribution is V-Mail, which speeds loving messages to our boys. This Eastman Kodak process, pioneered for airmail by Pan American and Imperial Airways, was turned over lock, stock and barrel to our Army and Navy. The Army post offices handle millions of V-Mail letters every day. These machines photographically reduce each letter. This completed roll of film contains 1,800 one-page letters. Here in these few mail sacks are 1,170,000 letters. They stack away in a small corner of the space in one clipper. Before V-Mail, the letters in these sacks would have taken all the lift and space of four clippers to fly them overseas. By clipper, these letters reach our boys overseas before another day breaks. Still another war service by alert Pan American flight crews was sighting and pinpointing many enemy submarines. The navigator quickly fixed the sub's latitude and longitude. The radio officer reported it. On receipt of the report, planes, PT boats, or other Navy craft roared out and dispatched the enemy sub to Davy Jones. Clippers often located and aided survivors of U-boat torpedoings. Desperate from hunger and thirst after days in the burning sun, sight of the clippers brought new life and hope to these pathetic souls. The clippers dropped food, water, and even radios, and informed surface ships of their whereabouts. Many were the heroes in the Pan American family. 200 have given their lives in performance of war duty. The Japs in turn 45 more in prison camps. And there have been hundreds of heroic acts by Pan American personnel. For example, there's Captain Marius Lodison, who took a giant 42-ton flying boat on a hazardous flight over Africa and the Indian Ocean to discover possible landing fields for the Allies. Captain William Moss. He landed his clipper in 15-foot shark-infested seas and rescued 48 survivors of a sinking troop ship. Captain John Hamilton rescued the 70 civilians from Wake Island in a breathtaking dash through the flaming Pacific. On another occasion, he was forced down in mid-Pacific, went through a 42-hour ordeal in 20-foot swells, 
yet brought his Navy transport plane safely to Honolulu. Captain Robert Ford and his valiant, resourceful crew saved the great Pacific Clipper for war service after Pearl Harbor by completing the first circuit of the globe by air on a secret roundabout course over dangerous mountains and desert. All of the flying was to transport troops and guns. We had to have rubber, one of the most precious strategic materials of World War II. The Japs seized the great Malay rubber plantations, so the Allies turned to Brazil's great Amazon jungles, where the richest rubber trade formerly flourished. Jungle natives paddle canoes loaded with crude rubber. From the most remote tributaries of this huge river basin, the rubber converged to the main Amazon branches, where it was hoisted aboard Pan American amphibians. From more than a thousand miles up in the deepest jungle of Brazil, this plane rushed its all rubber cargo in seven hours to the Pan American airport at Belém, at the mouth of the Amazon. From here, transport planes sped the rubber to the war plants of the United States for conversion into tires for army trucks, big bombers, and a thousand other war necessities. A secret weapon of the United Nations was a chain of 59 airports in 15 different countries, built for America's defense by Pan American in some of the roughest country known to man. They served our bombers and supply planes, which dashed across the South Atlantic to blast the Nazis out of Africa, then on to smash the Axis out of Europe and the Japs in Asia. Strategic locations were often hidden in unpenetrated jungles. Many engineers said airports could not be built on them. But Pan-American experts tackled the job in the snake, insect, and disease-ridden swamps. Mechanical shovels changed the course of rivers to make new airport sites. Slimy mud impeded men and vehicles alike. Huge pipes drained swamps, which bred anopheline mosquitoes, whose bites brought on the dreaded chills of malaria. Dynamite destroyed underground seepage, tore down mountains. Every piece of equipment, every tool, had to be made on the site or brought from the United States through sub-infested waters or enemy-threatened skies. But entire towns rose from the jungle with miraculous speed. Engineers worked untiringly in heat that sometimes hit 140 degrees. Great spike rollers were brought in by ox cart, plane, and boat. Stone was crushed for hard runway foundations. The fine gravel produced a perfect landing surface. Most of this work and the sites were secrets the enemy would like to learn. Even before the airports were finished, our planes began using them. Thousands and thousands of great air transport planes turned out by United States workmen sped by way of this secret weapon chain of airports to the battlefronts. We did the work of 90 trucks on the old Burma Road. These planes, unarmed and unaided, held the line across the hump for 18 months until the Air Transport Command of the Army Air Forces moved in with their great fleet of cargo carriers. This great bird of democracy upon the plains of Tibet attracts natives from miles around. None of them had ever seen an airplane before. the Flying Tigers battled the Japs in close partnership with this air transport line into China. With radio silenced and with uncharted mountains that would loom out of cloud banks just ahead, the pilots often sought out the bad weather to dodge death-dealing Japs. Here's the tranquil Salween Valley, actually the scene of many Jap attacks on the Burma Road of the Air. This 
has completed another great link in the war supply chain to Chongqing, war capital of China, now only a few short days from our mainland. These Pan American airmen volunteered to risk everything through the most treacherous mountain passes and weather known to man. By 1945, Many of them had dodged through the clouds and around 20,000 foot peaks between India and China 500 times. More than 35,000 crossings had been made. To aid the war effort, Pan American made available to the domestic airlines the airports and facilities it had pioneered, its radio and weather stations, and its wealth of ocean flying experience. These domestic carriers, which had never before flown beyond the borders of the United States, now joined with Pan American in flying war supplies with Army aircraft to the battlefronts over Pan American's ocean airways. Careful planning by weight and balance experts figured out ways of utilizing every inch of the Clipper's precious space. Truly amazing the variety of vital cargo carried. Boxes containing secret radar parts. United States war plants completed them. Next day they were in London. The Clippers took off at every hour of the day and night speeded everything from a nail to a machine gun across the oceans. They took entire radio stations with radio operators ready for action. Serums, medicine, and blood plasma. Emergency equipment for an African base. Perhaps the loving expressions of mothers and sweethearts to their men in Okinawa or Germany. Whatever the story behind each item, we know that somebody fighting somewhere for our way of life needed it badly. Pan American made more than 700 special flights, which secretly carried the world's wartime leaders to the conclaves at Casablanca and Cairo, and on hundreds of other special missions. Selected crews surveyed new wartime air transport routes over dangerous mountain and desert terrain, over oceans and to uncharted islands. Supplementing the 90,000 miles of Pan American's regular routes, were routes of the secret missions and special survey flights crisscrossing the world. Over these air trails, the Clippers carried Franklin D. Roosevelt, first president of the United States to fly overseas. Winston Churchill, wartime prime minister of Great Britain. Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. Madame Chiang Kai-shek. King Peter of Yugoslavia. General Marshall, chief of staff of our army. General Dwight Eisenhower, Admiral King, Admiral Nimitz, General Arnold, General Jimmy Doolittle, Archbishop Francis J. Spellman, Maxim Litvinov, Soviet Ambassador, Harry Hopkins, Special Emissary for the President of the United States, and many other important passengers. Pan American joined hands with the United States Navy to operate big Navy transport planes. The Navy men turned the ships over to Pan American crews who were veteran airmen of the very routes the Navy was using for vital supplies. These great cargo giants flew thousands of naval personnel together with guns, equipment, and ammunition to distant battlefronts. Every day, these ships of the sky took off eastward over the Atlantic and westward over the Pacific. They shuttled never-ending tons of war supplies to Europe, Africa, Hawaii, and the South Pacific. Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa are familiar places to Pan American's transport pilots who helped feed the men and the guns which drove the Japs from these bloody battlefields and many others. The Army overnight assigned Pan American to set up the longest and fastest big-scale air transport route in history, the famous 11,500-mile cannonball run from Miami to India. More than 100 specially trained flight crews regularly checked out of Miami to fly the huge new four-engine Skymasters on a record-breaking regular schedule of three and one-half days to the Orient. The cannonball was virtually shooting supplies to China and to the B-29 Raiders of Tokyo. Pan American was the largest air transport contractor to the War Department 
and the only such contractor to the Navy. To keep these big Army aircraft on schedule, flight crews sometimes stayed on the job 40 hours at a time with no rest. Some men flew the Atlantic four times in four days. These men got no publicity, no medals or glory, but no ordeal was too great for them. This service was one of America's secret weapons. Pan-American has made more than 15,000 ocean crossings during the war, and for many months averaged 17 crossings a day. We have told you just a little of the story of the bravery, loyalty, and teamwork of the Pan-American men and women in World War II. There were 25,000 of them at first, and they increased to 88,000. To all parts of the globe, over the victory routes they pioneered, they flew to the fronts where our boys gave their lives so democracy lived. Now that victory is won, the wartime trails which Pan American blazed into the world's most distant lands are becoming America's great peacetime air highways. And Pan American will continue to pioneer and to lead in ushering in a new era which even greater and faster clippers will cut through the smooth stratosphere to carry America's trade and America's travelers on their missions of peaceful commerce and goodwill. And to keep America first on the airways of the world.